So, um, remember yesterday uh, we went into shape memory and um, well, I tried to give you an idea of what shape memory was about concerning strains, uh, sorry, magnetic shape memory, <coughs> and um, how it is analogous to regular shape memory instead of um, applying strain or st applying stress, we, uh, we apply a magnetic field. <coughs> now, um, yes, we apply a magnetic field and we get this thing pulsating and um, we have, um, uh, we induce transitions from the martensite state to the austenite state. We have strains within the martensite state and all these things. And then we got to a point where I started showing you magnetization data and there we had started having some problems. I noticed that it is now a better time to understand what we're measuring, why we're measuring. So uh, today what I'd like to do is to um, sort of come in between and try to explain to you what we see from the measurements, how we measure, why we make certain measurements to understand certain things about these materials. There are two things, two kinds of measurements that I want to um, concentrate on, and those are the magnetization measurements and the strain measurements. These are complex systems these magnetic shape memory alloys, <clears throat> the Hoistler-based alloys. They have ferromagnetism, they have antiferromagnetism, they have spin glasses, they have blocking, they have all sorts of things in them. And all we're doing is we're measuring the magnetization and trying to understand everything. We won't get anywhere. But we'll get pretty far if we can understand the different individual comp concepts that we're introducing um, uh, in, in the, the, uh, the, the different aspects that we're trying to extract from our, our measurements. So, um, there are two important things in these systems since they're so complex and mixed. One is that we, under, uh, we have to understand some basic mixed magnetism properties. Those are spin glasses, which I tried to explain to you yesterday, but it was sort of... Uh, uh, I didn't have the, uh, the slides for that, uh, so um, I want to make that more clear. What is a spin glass and how we observe spin glasses in data and what kind of measurements do we do to do that? The second phenomena is blocking. This is also a frustration effect. It's similar to what we see as data in spin glasses, but it gives us different information. So these two things come into play, and I want to uh, start out by uh, looking at the spin glass uh, structure or the problem in a little bit more detail. So as I was saying yesterday, I hope it will be more clear today, is that if we basically have some kind of a triangle um, where all sides are equal, okay, and we put spins on each edge, we can build a ferromagnet out of that. There is no problem there. Okay. So, next, um, if we take one of these spins and turn it upside down so that we introduce an antiferromagnetic interaction here, what will the third spin do? Will it comply to this spin or will it comply to this spin? So it can't do anything. So it gets frustrated. It can't decide. And what happens is that it goes into some funny configuration. It can be any funny configuration. You can have perhaps an infinite combination of these configurations. 
So this is what we have. This is what we here have is a spin glass. And the reason why it's called a glass is because of the analogy to a regular chemical glass, silicon dioxide, yeah? So we have bonds in the crystalline form of silicon dioxide. So then if that is rapidly cooled or cooled down, then we get the glass structure where the structure is all messed up, yeah? It's a, it's a glass structure. And the same thing is here for the spins. So we call this a spin glass. Now, how do we recognize a spin glass? Since it's a magnetic phenomena, we should be able to observe this in the magnetization. What we perform is a temperature-dependent magnetization measurement. Now, actually, um, with a certain protocol. But today, if I were to give you a sample and ask you to measure the magnetization, what would you do with it if you don't know what this sample is? I can give you the chemical formula and things, but what would you do with it? Now, people come to me, uh, especially from the chemistry of places like that, it's been very popular for these people to measure the magnetization as well. So they tell me, oh, we just want a hysteresis curve at room temperature. We want to see the coercivity. Yeah, but what kind of information do you want? I mean, I'll give you the coercivity, but you don't have a chance of understanding what your sample is doing unless you know what it's doing in the full temperature range, what the interactions are at low temperature, so that at high temperature you know how those interactions develop and what you perhaps have. So when somebody gives you a sample, and if you are required to measure the magnetization, the best place to start with is to start from the beginning. And the beginning is a temperature-dependent magnetization before you do any kind of a uh, hysteresis loop or anything like that. Secondly, how do you perform a magnetization measurement? You know, when you're doing a magnetization measurement, you have to apply a field. And what kind of a field do you want to apply? Do you want to apply a small field, a large field, medium field? Now, if you apply no field, then your system is there, and it's in its real state because it's not disturbed with an external field. So any magnetization over there is, is there for you to see. But since you haven't applied a field, uh, then you don't get a signal, let's say. So what do you have to do? If you don't want to disturb the system, the uh, delicate interactions that are happening in there, which can be destroyed by applying a large field, the first thing you do is you measure in a small field. Small field being conventionally something like between 10 Ersteds and 100 Ersteds, let's say, and today any modern magnetometer can handle that. Now, so when you're applying these very small fields, you're not messing up anything in there, and you're taking a real look of what is going on. Now, if you pump in a very large field in the order of Teslas, two Tesla, five Tesla or something, then you're saturating the whole thing. If there are any little interactions going on in there, you're not seeing them anymore. But at the same time, you're extracting information on the saturation magnetization. You need the high fields as well. Low fields alone are not enough. So you have to measure in high fields as well to, under to see what the magnetic moments are, what they do in saturations, and things like that. So in the case when we have a spin glass, we I'm showing you here a measurement, which I took out of a publication on a typical spin glass, which is copper manganese. They're usually more dilute manganese. In this case, it's about 13%. It's a little bit higher. It doesn't make much difference. And we take the sample. Of course, we all sit at room temperature. And so we're up here somewhere. <clears throat> now, we take our sample to low temperature. We put it into the magnetometer and let it cool down. So we bring the sample into a certain state. And this state is called the zero field cooled state. Okay? 
Now there's a confusion here sometimes. We talk about zero field cooled states and zero field cooled measurements. They're both the same thing, but actually it's a state, but and in practice it has sort of developed so that we understand uh, that it is also a measurement. But zero field cooled or zero field cooling is the condition that we take our sample and we cool it down to the lowest temperature that we have. But the measurement itself is taken on warming. Okay? So the state is zero field cooled. So we're doing a warming measurement on a zero field cooled system. So whenever you see this, you say, uh-huh, okay, my sample has been brought down to the lowest temperature in zero field period. Nothing else. So this is brought down in zero field, and then we have to apply a small field to do a measurement. So in this case, um, they really uh, um, overdid it. I mean, it didn't have to be that small, but it's, it's good, okay? So we have a very small field. So what happens now? The, uh, the, uh, the magnetization, or the susceptibility, whichever way you want to look at it, increases with increasing temperature. Why does it increase with increasing temperature? Okay, magnetizations don't increase with increasing temperature. They drop usually, yeah? So, um, what have we done? We have frozen our system here at this point. So we were maybe something like a paramagnet, something else about high, high temperature. But we have a configuration here which is frozen at this point. And we've applied a little field. And we're increasing the temperature. So we have a competition between the energy provided by the applied field and the thermal energy, the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Okay? Now, this applied field of one Ersted can't do very much for the magnetization at these temperatures. As we start increasing the temperature, the field assisted by the thermal energy can cause a further alignment of the frozen state. So actually we're melting it, okay? We're melting the frozen state. Melting it means that we are turning these things more and more into a configuration that looks something like this. So that's why all zero field cooled magnetizations, wherever you see one, in most cases, I can't find a, a counterexample at the moment, they increase with increasing temperature. You always see this. It increases and increases, and it gets to a certain point, after which it starts decreasing. So why does it decrease? It's because these things here are no longer frozen. They're free to rotate in all sorts of directions. They become a paramagnet. They don't see each other anymore. These things interact. That is, they see each other only when they're below the freezing temperature. Okay? When you're above the freezing temperature, uh, these spins don't care what they're doing. It's all paramagnetic. And with increasing temperature, then you have a decrease in the magnetization, uh, in the susceptibility that follows more or less the standard Curie vice or the Curie behavior. So that was a zero field cooled. Now, what do we do after we stop our measurement over here? We don't remove the field. We have our field. And with the same field, we go back down. Okay? This is the field cooled case that we have. This is a measurement. This is not a state. This is also a state. I mean, if you, if you consider the FC, if you didn't do a measurement and you brought the whole thing down to here in an applied magnetic field, that is a field cooled state. That's true but it's also a field-cooled measurement. So we go down, we come to the freezing temperature, and then at the freezing temperature, just below it, we start seeing the splitting between the zero field-cooled and the field-cooled, and it gets larger and larger, okay? 
Now, why has this happened? It's because there is a difference when I cool a randomly aligned or freeze a randomly aligned magnetic system in a field or without a field. In the case that I don't apply a field, then there is no preferred direction given to the freezing, so the net magnetization is practically zero here. It should ideally go down to zero if there are no impurities and things like that in it. But here, if we cool this in a magnetic field, then we're giving a preferred direction to the freezing. It's still freezing, but these things are more, have a, have a component, let's say, along a certain preferred direction, that is in the direction of the magnetic field. So, they freeze. But after they freeze, nothing much happens, and this goes quite relatively flat, okay? Um, because once you've frozen them, then you've given the preferred direction, and as we're decreasing the temperature, we're, re we're reducing the thermal agitations, and the field cannot um, further increase the magnetization because it's, it's frozen, and the small field that we've applied on cooling is not going to get more effective as we go down in lower temperature. It's going to be less effective, so it's just going to give the magnetization what we had up here. There are these little bumps and things like that going on over here. Let me just make a diversion and uh, tell you also what that is. When you come close to critical temperatures from below, what happens? I mean, you have a magnetic system. That magnetic system has some kind of an anisotropy, okay? So the spins are fixed one way or another. And you have an external magnetic field. As you approach any critical temperature, this anisotropy weakens all of a sudden. It doesn't have to be a spin glass. You can have a regular ferromagnet. It's just when you approach the critical temperature, you have a weakening of the anisotropy before you reach the Curie temperature or before you reach any uh, other temperature. So if you have a, when the anisotropy weakens, then your external field becomes more capable of aligning more spins and you usually have this bump over here, which is called a Hopkinson peak in general. It's the terminology is usually used for ferromagnets, but you can, it's basically the, uh, uh, the, the principle is the same. So if you see a splitting of this sort, usually at temperatures below 70 down to 10 Kelvin or something like that, then you can be assured that you see some kind of a spin glass, uh, provided that this thing over here is running more or less flat. If this is running more differently, then we have other problems. I'll show you that as well. Now, since this is frozen, what happens is that if I feel cool this thing and then switch off the magnetic field and try to observe this over time, we find that these magnetizations always relax. This point, if I switch off the field, it will tend to come down here over a very, very long periods of time. So you see much time effects which are related to these as well. Below the freezing temperature, when you apply a magnetic field and remove it, you always find a long time decay, which is also characteristic of the spin glass. So if you see things like this, and if you see time dependence, then you have a spin glass. Now, what can happen um, if I play around with this a little bit? I'm here, let's say, in the zero field cool state. I came down with zero field, I started measuring. I go up and up and up. If I want to go back down, what happens is that this does not come down here. 
it goes like that. And if I go back up again, it doesn't do anything until I come back on the curve, and then it starts going up. If I reverse the temperature, then I go like that and increase it, I go like that until I come up here. So it remembers where it is as you're increasing the temperature. When it comes to a certain state, then it gets locked in that state, and I cannot, I cannot go back in the freezing. I give it another configuration. Each, each time you go back, you give the system a new spin configuration, then it's frozen in that configuration, go down in temperature, up in temperature, up along the curve again, and uh, so you see these non-equilibrium effects. Always. So this is the spin glass, okay? Are there any questions here? For the exiting, why is it diffused after the bump? This one. This decrease. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, it's not a decrease; it's an increase. <laughs> okay. Now, don't get confused, because I'm measuring in this. I'm uh, uh, sorry. This is this is the field cool. Why it is decreasing? Um, this is, um, as I said, when you go down in the temperature, you have um, you have a a freezing here. Okay, you've given it a certain configuration, and this configuration. Let's get the okay. Tell me once more. Where, where should I look? Am I looking here? Okay. So when it is decreasing, the anisotropy. Uh, the, the, you're at the freezing temperature, and the anisotropy is weak. Okay the anisotropy strengthens as you go down further in temperature. And so, when you have a weak anisotropy, you have a better interaction with the field and, the, uh, 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 and, and whatever is in there. But when you go down in temperature, the anisotropy increases. And if there are any imperfections and things like that, that will, uh, because of the increase of the anisotropy, and the interaction of these imperfections, the, in, the local fields caused by the inf imperfections can overcome the effect of the external field so that there will be a small decrease. Okay? Is that okay? Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Now let's come to superparamagnetism. Superparamagnetism is also a time-dependent property. You have all sorts of time dependencies. And when you measure the magnetization, much looks like um, what we see uh, as, as what we see in spin glasses. And how do we distinguish these? What is a super power magnet? Uh, and what is a spin glass? Okay, spin glass is a frustration effect. And um, how do we look at a, a super paramagnet? So what we have here is a, uh, a particle. It's a multi-magnetic domain, large ferromagnetic particle. By large, we mean it's more than 50 nanometers. Okay? It's big. If it's 50 nanometers or 50 meters, it wouldn't make much difference anyhow. So, and these are uh, these are composed of, of magnetic domains. They have, but to the outside world, of course, the magnetization is uh, essentially zero. So then we change the particle size. We change them down to such a size that it goes to and below the domain size. And this gives us a single domain particle. Okay? So then, we have single magnetic domain nanoparticles. When we go down to um, sizes which are about uh, up to about 30 nanometers or 20 nanometers, we start getting single domain particles like this. 
So if we have single domain particles, what we find is that each particle, the magnetization of each particle, uh, may be pointing into any random direction. Uh, we have an easy axis for each particle, so the particles are there. So what happens to these particles? When you're down at these sizes, these spins, which are pointing in one direction, can all of a sudden rotate by 180 degrees in the other direction by overcoming a certain energy barrier. So if you are at sufficiently high temperature, you can be above the Curie temperature where these spins are uh, disordered, but you can also be below the Curie temperature where these spins are ordered. So we're actually looking at the case not when these are paramagnetic, not when the individual particles are paramagnetic, but when the individual particles are ferromagnetic. So these jump back and forth with a certain probability, with a certain characteristic time. So all these particles, when you look at it together, they're all individually ferromagnetic, but collectively, they look like a paramagnet. So in many cases, what you will be seeing is some um, property that is very closely related to a paramagnet, but here in this case, of course, it's a paramagnet, with individual particles having a much larger magnetic moment than our conventional paramagnets, where you would have a single moment on a single uh, atomic uh, site, let's say. So, um, if we apply a magnetic field to this thing, a saturation field, then all these spins, they'll point only in one direction, and they will saturate. If we apply a very small field, to this case, then these spins will also point all in one direction. And this does not necessarily have to be a saturation field. This requires a high saturation field to come into this case, but this requires maybe a very, very small field, and it will all point in one direction. So it turns out that if we look at coercivities of large particles and small particles, the large particles have a certain coercivity, which is caused by the internal uh, mechanisms dealing with domain walls and things. But when we come to these particles, we have, um, we don't have to apply much of a field to get them into saturation. I just wanted to write here on the board that we have a characteristic nail time that um, we observe. Um, the hopping from one particular state to another particular state, that is, by rotating these 180 degrees or so, happens in the order of about um, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 seconds. Okay? So these are quite fast. Now, if these things are hopping, what do we understand by blocking? The blocking is defined by your measurement time. If, you, if, you're measure, if you're measuring magnetization, which is an infinite time, because you're measuring the magnetization, you're looking at it, compared to the 10 to the minus 10 to the 10 seconds, then um, you see an overall picture uh, of whatever your system is, is doing. It's, it's fluctuating because you're you're, you continue, you're, you're averaging over the whole fluctuations. But if I do a faster measurement, 
where the measurement time is, in, is much faster than 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 10 seconds, what am I doing? I'm taking a snapshot, okay? I'm taking a snapshot of a configuration of a system which I define as blocked. It's blocked for that measuring time. If I measure at a longer time, it's not blocked. Okay, so it's a question of convention. So how do we measure these uh, blocking temperatures um, if this is the, the characteristic time, the nail um, characteristic uh, time, which is uh, given as tau zero times the exponential of the magnetocrystalline and isotropy times the volume divided by the Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. So these, uh, <clears throat> these things here are pointing in a certain particular direction because they have a certain anisotropy. So we have here K, that is the magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy per unit volume, and that is the volume of the uh, particle that we have. So this is the activation energy, more or less, at a particular temperature. And then we have here the characteristic time, and this is the time needed uh, for the reversal of the spins. Now, um, if, so if our measuring time, let's say that tau m is the measuring time, Our measurement time can be either much larger than the than tau n, or in this case, we we don't see blocking, we see fluctuations. And in the case when the measurement time is much less than tau n, then we take a snapshot and we have the blocking. So the, in the event that tau m is equal to tau n, then we should be at the blocking temperature. In other words, we can then rewrite this as tau m equal to tau zero, and then we have the exponential KV over Boltzmann constant. And now we have here the blocking temperature. So um, instead of changing the time of our experiment, if we change the temperature, we can find a blocking temperature corresponding, a cert corresponding to a certain um, uh, characteristic time. And if we take the logarithms of both sides of these things, we find that the, uh, the blocking temperature turns out to be, uh, again, K times the volume over the, uh, this is the cable punch constant, and then we have the logarithm of tau m over tau zero. This is a number which is in the order of about 20 to 30, I think, as far as I can remember. So um, f here we can sort of estimate what the blocking temperature is, provided that we know the volume in the magnetocrystalline and isotropy. Okay, let's say we've measured the magnetocrystalline and isotropy by somehow. The volume, uh, we can take our particles, put it under an electron microscope, and we can see what the average size is, yeah? So if all the particles have the same size, which is a very unlikely case, then this will give us our blocking temperature. If there's a distribution in the volume, then we have to account for the size distributions 
in these equations to get some kind of a blocking temperature. So now, <clears throat> what do we do or what do we get when we measure the temperature dependence of the magnetization? Now, as I said, we have a sample of nanoparticles, let's say iron oxide. Everybody likes iron oxide these days, and a lot of people play around with it. And um, we don't know what it is. We don't know what's going on with it. And we don't know whether it's blocked or not blocked. So we have to do an experiment which is going to give us information on whether it is blocked or not blocked. And the way to do this is to do it just as we did it for a spin glass. Do a measurement of zero field cooled and field cooled. Okay? Now, when we do such a measurement, we get some curves that look like this. It looks very similar to what we see in a spin glass, but there is a difference in that this blocking temperature can range from several tens of kelvins or even less, all the way up to 300, 500 kelvin. What else do we see? Okay, in the zero field, we have a zero field cooled case and a field cooled case. In the zero field cooled case, again, what has happened? When everything is blocked, then the system sees everything blocked at this temperature over here. It's frozen. When we go above this temperature, in the time scale that we are measuring, then we start seeing the fluctuations, just as we see and saw in the uh, spin glass case. There's not much difference in that sense. And then we have this behavior, which is like a paramagnet. If you would plot the inverse susceptibility of this and estimate it, the effective magnetic moment, you can do it. It will be linear, and you will get an effective magnetic moment, which is very large, of course. But when we're doing the field cooling experiment, what happens? When we come to the blocking temperature, this thing doesn't turn around. It goes up. It just continues to go up, OK? Because your external field here is sufficient to handle KT, which opposes the alignment of the giant spins that you have in the, um, in the particles, okay? So the particles are here again, just to remind you what is happening here, okay? Uh, so here, when we're above the blocking temperature, these are random, but they align more and more in the direction of the spin, and then when you come over here, they tend to be, they are blocked then, they don't fluctuate within themselves anymore, but what they do is they act like a paramagnet as you go down. So this is blocking. Now, what kind of uh, characteristics do we have? If we look at the coercive field, um, this is a red line, okay? It's slightly more different than this blue anyhow. And uh, where else? Okay, and this is also a red line. So this red line corresponds to this red line, okay, in a sense. So if the particles are very small, about 2 to 10 nanometers, then we have a curve, a magnetization curve that looks like this, okay? There is no coercivity. The coercivity is zero. None at all, okay? So if the particle size, let's start from here, this size. If the particle size is, is large, so this is yellow, and you're at high temperature, then you have a hysteresis curve that looks something like this with a certain coercivity. And this coercivity increases as you decrease the particle size. And when you come to a critical particle size, let's say, um, then you have a maximum in your coercivity, this one over here. But then as the particles get smaller, 
then so does the coercivity. It goes down, and in fact, this yellow, it's green, yellow, or whatever, uh, this will correspond to this again, something like this, and when you go down, then you have no coercivity. So these are extremely soft magnetic materials uh, that can be rotated in fields that are very, very small. Now, <clears throat> so this is blocking. <clears throat> are there any questions here concerning blocking? Okay. So, um, do you grasp the difference between the spin glass and the blocking and how we see that in the magnetization? Okay. So, in both cases, what we did was we measured the zero field cooled and field cooled magnetizations in very small fields. If we measure in high fields, what happens? In the case of the spin glass, <clears throat> you lose the splitting. As you measure in higher and higher fields, you begin to lose the splitting, and at some time, you may see an effect of the freezing temperature, but then all curves will lie on top of each other. So when you measure in high fields, you suppress all these fine things over here, and you just saturate the whole thing, and you measure something. So measuring in high fields and spin glasses does not provide you the splitting, so it does not provide you information on whether it's a spin glass or not. If you have any, um, if you have a sample and um, you are, um, you think that it may be a spin glass, you start measuring in small fields definitely. If you have a sample and you start measuring, my way of doing it is that independent of what the sample is, what the system is, we always start by measuring in the smallest field possible. That is a rule, okay? And then you can apply fields as much as you want once you know what the intrinsic interactions that there more or less look like. So in the case of the superparamagnet, we have the splitting here again. If we were to zero field cool this and apply several Tesla, uh, this would go all the way up there and we would again see no difference between any um, curves here that, um, as, as, any difference between a zero field cool curve and a field cool curve. So in all cases, whatever you have, you start by measuring in small fields. Now, before I go any further, I think I'll just go back. <laughs> uh, these are the basic underlying principles, let's say, um, of measuring magnetization. Um, you measure in small fields, you see what is happening. Are there splittings and are there no splittings? Now, when you come to Hoistlers, which we will be doing right now, perhaps after the break. Um, now, with Hoistlers, which are so complex, which have so many different magnetic interactions, um, things are not that easy anymore. You don't have a chance of understanding anything when you look at the magnetization data first. So whatever you do, particularly in hoisters, you have to, or other complex systems, you have to do these measurements in very small fields. Otherwise, uh, you lose everything. And people have lost a lot what they have, should have seen in, in the very, very past. Um, be, well, spin glasses started coming out in the 1970s or something like that, yeah? And then they realized that they should be, start measuring in small fields. Otherwise, um, earlier it was more popular to measure in saturation or in high fields uh, to extract information. Maybe that was because of the magnetometers available at that time as well. Um, but it is not only after spin glasses came out that the importance of measuring in small fields came also. So to understand hoisters, 
we're going to do the same kind of measurements and I'm going to show you then what kind of information we can extract already with what we know from the, in the complex mechanism of oysters. Okay? So then uh, we'll see each other after the break. Just because you said that you need to go on to Tesla after this. Yeah. So, uh, let's say, can a thing like you spin glass and super paramagnetic? There are two other terminologies like the uh, magnetic cluster glass and, uh, and core shell structure, magnetic core shell structure. Yes. So, can you tell how uh, we can distinguish between them from uh, magnetization versus temperature? Okay. Um, I can give you a brief answer on that. Uh, now, what I try to show you here, or what I try to show the, uh, the, the younger students, actually, uh, was to give an idea of the simplest cases. And the simplest cases is our triangular structure and our, um, our blocking. These are two important concepts to be able to see the others. Now, we have fan magnetism, uh, core shell magnetism, we have mictomagnetism. Um, there's a lot of variety, and all these shows splittings. And to distinguish those, then um, usually we cannot do that with one single measurement in the magnetization. We will find these splittings everywhere, but we need complementary um, experiments for that. The best is, of course, what is used is neutron diffraction in that sense. So you have to know the structure, whether there's something going on with the structure. And uh, um, it can be spiral magnetism. It can be lots of other kinds of frustrations, of course. But even in the case of spin glasses and in blocking, in many cases, the magnetization will not give you the complete information. It is the simplest way of measurement. It's the simplest way of acquiring a global information on what is going on in the systems. But by no means you, can you understand anything about the microscopics in the system. Okay, so these, all these other special kinds of uh, 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 situations, which also lead to frustration, have to be sort of considered on their own. But I'll, I'll stick to the simplest things at the moment over here. Okay? <clears throat> Okay, now it just occurred to me uh, while I was out there, I wanted to say something else about nickel titanium and a common use is that, uh, you know your glasses, yes. not many of you are wearing them I suppose, but I mean, uh, since several years you have this uh, thing, uh, this flexibility, flexible joints over here. Well, those are nickel titanium, okay? <laughs> it's just that you know that you probably have it already somewhere around your eyes if you have that property. And that's, that is a, that's another way, that's, that's called a rubber-like effect, okay? So it happens, with, it's, it's a special way that the nickel titanium is trained so that it has this flexibility in the martensite state. Otherwise, I mean, if you're in a cold region of somewhere uh, in the world um, and it undergoes a martensitic transition, then this won't work anymore. And neither will your flexible titanium glasses or things. Uh, so these to work, you already have to be in the martensite state, <laughs> okay? And um, somehow um, these people have developed these things so that they work also at low temperature. So I was nickel titanium. So um, <clears throat> now um, we'll come to some more complex cases. Um, now that. I hope you have a certain idea of what frustration in general is. Um, more complex cases is the hoister. I mean, how much more complex can you get? It's, uh, um, it's has all sorts of things in it. So here we have um, magnetization curves. We have a Hoistler. In this case, we have nickel manganese indium. You know, yesterday I tried to, we can always go back to that, tried to present you how we make new alloys, how we, new choose, how we choose new compositions and things like that, um, depending on where we are on the phase diagram. And um, uh, doing this, 
we chose a series of nickel manganese indium and started studying them with the magnetization. So what you see is um, these are nickel manganese indium alloys with different compositions. Now, what do we do? We have a material, we start out with it, and we don't know what it is, we don't know what to do with it. The best thing you can do is do, do a zero field cooled, field cooled measurement. Yeah, okay, that's what we learn. We start with a sample which is about 0 0.17. We have zero field cooled, field cooled, and I'll tell you why we have field heated. That is an extra, that's a bonus. Nothing happens. You see, you do get states, you do get things where, where you don't have any splitting. There is no splitting. Everything looks nice. It's, uh, it goes up, and they all practically lie on each other. Let's see, the, uh, the zero feel cooled. Yeah, it makes something over here just a little bit maybe, but uh, you know, you always have impurities in your sample which can bring in some interaction so that it's mixed. So there's nothing, basically. Now you go up to a higher composition, there's again nothing. So these are um, off stoichiometric Oislers, but unlike um, nickel manganese gallium in its stoichiometric case, these do not undergo a martensitic transition. So that makes nickel manganese gallium a little bit unique in all these things. It's the only Two, it's the only compound with the 211 stoichiometry, a Hoysal compound with the 211 stoichiometry that undergoes a martensitic transition. So, now, what else information? Okay, there's nothing here, there's no splitting, but there's some very important information lying here as well. These measurements that are conducted in very small fields, they tell us exactly what the Curie temperature is, more or less exactly, which you cannot get from high field magnetizations. You can, you can estimate something, but it's so smeared out that you do not get things that are sharp like this. These are extremely sharp. These are measured in 50 Ersted. Now, why are they sharp? Why are they sharp? Why are they so sharp? We're far from saturation. Let's look at this one. This one is particularly sharp. So if you, um, coming from this direction or this direction doesn't matter at all. Um, what happens is that you have applied a very, very small field. And uh, at some temperature, the magnetization started to rise extremely fast in this magnetic field. And then you go down and nothing happens. Now, the reason why nothing happens is, that, is, is because of the same reason why nothing happens in the spin glass as well. Your external field is no longer capable of aligning any further magnetic moments as the temperature decreases because your KT gets smaller and smaller, your magnetic field is sitting there, and um, things are getting stiffer. So the magnetic field, this plateau that you see here, when you measure um, in a small field, um, is the magnetization of 50 Ersteds. This is something very, very small. And those several spins which can react to your 50 Ersteds will disalign as soon as the temperature is just high enough. Because the 50 Ersteds is just aligning some of your spins. I mean, there's a vast amount over there which is not even seeing the 50 Ersteds. And that is sufficient, these small amounts of, of, of uh, spins that align with your magnetic field is sufficient to give you a very exact Curie temperature, okay? This is much better than doing Eric plots, I think. We'll come to that as well, um, using some uh, Landau theory, doing Eric plots, looking for linearities and whatnot. Uh, is a method, of course, um, but if you want to really see a Curie temperature really experimentally, this is the experiment that should be done. So then, again in 50 Ersted, we go to another composition. And this is where everything starts. 
So what do we have here? We have here everything. Everything, everything, and literally everything. Everything, but this everything uh, is not detectable by only a single experiment. You measure something like this and you wonder what this is for many years before you really solve the problem. So, uh, but we have some interesting information. We know what the Curie temperature is, okay? Uh, from these over here, measuring in a small field, giving such a steep rise, tells us that we have a good ferromagnet there. <coughs> and what else do we know? <coughs> we know that this high temperature state here is an austenite state. And how do we know that from the magnetization? No. We have to do our other measurements. We have to do x-ray measurements. We have to know the crystallography. Okay? So you can't look at the magnetization and just say, I know everything. We know that this is an austenite state because we've looked at the, uh, at the magnetizations. And we know that these are in a martensite state because we eventually did the x-rays as well. But okay, before doing the x-rays, looking at this, and if you've looked at enough data, then you start saying, yeah, okay, there's a transition here. Okay. So, we have our Curie temperature over here. Now, let's go step by step then. What do we do? We start our measurements by zero field cooling. So we go down here. It's almost zero, you see. And then we apply our magnetic field and we start measuring. And just as the case that we had seen in the spin glass or in the blocking case, that we have here a maximum and then a minimum and then our Curie temperature. And then without removing the field, we start going back. We have the field cooled case. Those are the black dotted lines. And we follow this here. So the field cooled state or the measurement is a decreasing temperature measurement. The zero field cooled measurement is an increasing temperature measurement. So what do we see here? Zero field cooled, field cooled. We see these, um, well, huge differences. Now, we come to a point where we do another kind of a measurement that we don't do in spin glass or uh, blocking temperature or, or blocking measurements. We do a field warming measurement. Okay? So after we have done the field cooled measurement, we do a field warming measurement. And you see that the field warming measurement and the zero field cooled measurement, they are done in both directions. There is a splitting between them, but at some point they join. They have to join because they're measured in the same direction. They join here and they go together all the way above the Curie temperature again. <clears throat> so, going back to spin glasses, we had a reason for doing zero field cooled and field cooled measurements because we wanted to see <clears throat> whether there is any magnetic freezing. And we do the same thing here with the zero field cooled and field cooled, again to see if there is any magnetic freezing. And there is magnetic freezing. We see it over here. But these things are going so many different structural transitions. If there is a structural transition of the first order, then we should have some kind of a hysteresis of the transition. We should have the supercooling and the superheating. And that we cannot see in the zero field cooled and field cooled because they're measured in the same direction, both on increasing temperature. We have to also measure in field with increasing temperature as well. And that's the field warming or the field heating. So let's look at those two. We come down here. That's the field cooling. And then we have the field warming. And what do we see? We see this tremendous hysteresis. 
over here. So the field cooling and the field warming, when we look at those two, we see information related to the first order transition. There are two states, two crystallographic states. And because the magnetic moments of the two crystallographic states are different, we can observe something in the magnetization. If they were not different, we couldn't. The magnetization couldn't detect the difference. Of course, that is a condition, that both states should have some uh, different magnetic properties so that they would be revealed by the magnetization measurements. And in the case, it is so. So we come down to the temperature, and we come th go through here as with a, uh, through a maximum. And after that maximum, this magnetization starts to decrease. We don't know why, but it just starts decreasing. Uh, so we say here that, okay, this part is ferromagnetic, just like here, or just like here. This goes, there's the Curie temperature, there's the ferromagnetic part of the austenite. But as soon as we go here, then we introduce some kind of a new structure over there. So we say, okay, this must, something's happening over there, so this must be the beginning of some transition, so we mark that as the MS temperature. Is it correct what we do? I don't know. But we see that there's a deviation from the magnetization curve. Well, if something's happening at that temperature, well, then, uh, then we can sort of consider that as the MS temperature. So then we go down further, and this thing goes through a minimum, and it starts going up. And then when we come back down, we find here that there is a splitting between the field cooled and the field warming. And as we go down here, then we go through another minimum, and then we go over here. So what can we identify here when we're going back up again? We identify another maximum. And this maximum is slightly displaced with respect to the maximum that we see when we're decreasing the temperature. So this is the Martensite start temperature, and this is the austenite finish temperature. These we can identify. But is it true? We don't know. We have to do further measurements. So what do we do? We do a differential scanning calorimetry or a specific heat measurement. We measure the heat flow in both directions, and we identify some peaks and things like that, and we try to correlate what we identify in the DSC measurements, whether they cor correspond to these temperatures, the peaks, because the DSC measurements, okay, they have some peaks, peaks have some width and things. So iteratively, we try to label and give a Martensite start temperature as a number for these systems. That's how we do it. We say, okay, the DSC gives a bump around here. We say that, okay, then MS should be this in the magnetization more or less. So this is how we start identifying um, crystallographic transition temperatures. So where's MF? We don't know. This won't tell us anything, okay? We have these things going on. Is it this minimum? Well, it could be. Uh, in fact, when you do the DSC measurements, it turns out to be something close to this minimum. And these minimums, are these two minima, are displaced by practically the same amount over here because you have all the Martensitic transition temperatures going on. So, well, if this is MF and this is AS, then what's all this mess over here? So uh, it took us years to understand that. So looking at the magnetization just like this, you can't do anything. It took us temperature-dependent X-ray measurements all around, and we found out at the end that we have other phenomena going on over here, which is related to intermartensitic transitions. Now, how do you understand that? You have to do other measurements. What do you do? You do resistivity measurements. Now, resistance is a scattering mechanism, so if you have two different structures, the scattering mechanisms change, and you see a lot of difference in the resistivity. So the resistivity will give you a better uh, understanding of what the, uh, this transition region is. In fact, you can measure that. But that's still not enough. You want to know what the structure, structurally is happening, so you have to do x-rays at low temperatures. So it's a cumbersome task. It takes years. Uh, and looking at the magnetization data alone does not give you the complete information. It gives you a lot of information. 
And it also tells you what you should do next. Because whatever you don't understand, you have to go to that temperature and devise yourself another experiment. Okay? So, this is the Hoistler. And you see, okay, okay, we said we had intermartensitic transition temperature here. We have um, the characteristic temperatures around here, and so on. But what else do we have? We have something very, very important over here. The magnetization drops. Now, why does it drop? You have absolutely no chance of understanding this, why it drops from this. So this is ferromagnetic, okay. So if I go over here, is it anti-ferromagnetic? Is it something else? I can do field-dependent magnetization measurements. I can see a few things that will give me a hint. But the only way of really understanding what is going on here is uh, requires some very special techniques. I may have time to go into those, and those are polarized neutron experiments, neutron scattering experiments. The diffuse polarized neutron scattering experiments, which gives you an idea of what the configurations here are. Remember, what do we have? We have 5M, 7M structures. We have not the simple L10, but we have all sorts of complex structures. Now, here we have a cubic structure. Fine, I can place a ferromagnet on that. And then when we come below the Martensitic transition temperature, what do we have? We have some kind of a modulated state. Now, Let's say we have 5M or 7M or whatever. Now, if I try to configure an antiferromagnet on this funny, wiggly 5M or 7M shape, how would I do it? How would I put the spins antiparallel on that? It won't work. It's, it's kind of funny, and, and nobody knows how. And until today, it's still not known why this is so. But... I said antiferromagnet, how do I come to that? It's because we did polarized neutron experiments and we know that we have short range antiferromagnetic correlations over here, okay? We see them, we see them as broad peaks and things and uh, we know that when we are coming from this state to this state, we are developing short-range antiferromagnetic correlations. In some cases, this can go all the way down to zero, perhaps, and then it goes back up again. So initially, what we had over here was ferromagnetism, and over here, we see that ferromagnetism starts disappearing, and we have short-range antiferromagnetism. We cannot get long-range antiferromagnetism in this structure. It doesn't fit, and then, as we decrease the temperature, then something else starts going on, and we're getting the ferromagnetism back there again. These are still open questions. These are things that you will always have to think about. Now I'm talking to the PhD students more, that um, in, their, in the course of these, um, uh, of trying to analyze these uh, data, uh, you really need other kinds of experiments to see what is really going on over here. Now, um, this, okay, we have antiferromagnetic correlations. We take that for granted. Now I'm talking to everybody again. So when we go down here, what does this resemble? It resembles, some, this resembles something like a blocking, doesn't it? It resembles the blocking curve. We go down here, zero field curve, and then it goes up here again. Ah, but these aren't nanoparticles. These are bulk materials. So how do we have blocking in bulk materials? You do get bulk, uh, blocking in bulk materials also. If you have um, within these systems mixed magnetism with the magnetic regions which are in the order of uh, 3 to 10 nanometers or something, then they act like um, nanoparticles in a sense so that blocking can be observed in these systems as well. So 
this looks very much like blocking. When we zero fuel cool it, and then when we cool it back down again. But is it just pure blocking? We have here some funny behavior, which looks like a ferromagnetic behavior if the field were large. But the field is small. Since the field is small, any ferromagnetic transition should be sharp, like here, here, and here. But this is not sharp. It's broad. So this magnetization data tells us that, yes, somewhere around here, there is some transition going on, some long-range ordering. It's true. But uh, exactly what kind of long-range ordering that is and how these different magnetic structures are mixed, we cannot resolve it from the magnetization data here. So what do we have here? What have we learned from this? We've learned how to measure. And to a certain extent, we learned how to interpret. This is the standard measurement that you do when you get anything as a sample. <clears throat> when you have something as a sample, and it's usually something new, so you have to know whether you have mixed magnetic interactions, and you also have to know whether you have any structural changes. Even in iron oxide, in iron oxide, you can have various magnetic interactions, which will give rise to some splitting. And then you have the vervey transition in the iron oxides. And at this transition, <coughs> you can have a coupling to the structure, which will also give you a small hysteresis in the magnetization or in other measured quantities as well. So whatever you do, you take your sample and you do this before you do anything else. So now we've confined ourselves to low fields for the moment. What happens when we go to high fields? What kind of information do we get? So this is the low field with, it's just the same, it's the same data that I just showed you with all the mess. Now, this is nickel manganese gallium. You see, if you measure in very small fields in nickel manganese gallium, what you get is you have a zero field case that looks like this. You have a jump at the martensitic transition temperature, goes down, goes back up, and it goes back down again. So in the light of what we have just learned, what do we see here? We see a Curie temperature. We see a difference in the field cool and field warming here, which looks like an intermartensitic transition. Okay? Now that we've seen other data, we can sort of assess what is going on with this data. We have a martensite start temperature somewhere around here. We have a martensite finish temperature, perhaps an austenite start and an austenite finish. So we start recognizing more and more. It's just a question of experience. The more you measure, the more you see the data, and the more you start understanding what corresponds to what. It's not that each data is a different data. They all have some kind of links to one another. So that's how you understand it. You take a composition series, and you see how these features developed as a function of composition, and then iteratively, with other experimental methods, you try to understand what is going on over here. So nickel manganese gallium, I want to come back to that because I was telling you that when you measure nickel manganese gallium in small fields, the features are more or less the same as in nickel manganese indium or nickel manganese tin or nickel manganese antimony. They look quite similar. But when you go to high fields, what normally happens in spin glasses and in blocking, you lose the splitting in the zero field cooled and the field cooled, and you lose all sorts of other features, and you just get a single curve. What happened here in the case of Oyslers 
is that these f 